Our guest today is the Chief Technology Officer for the City of Chicago. Mayor Rahm Emanuel gave him these marching orders, and I quote, leverage technology to ensure that the City of Chicago delivers better services at a lower cost to the taxpayers, unquote. Before joining the City of Chicago, our guest today worked for IBM. He earned his master's degree from Georgia Tech. Our guest today lives in Chicago with his wife, Robin, and their three beautiful children. Ladies and gentlemen, John Tolva. John? Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Tweed, for organizing this. Um, and thanks to the numerous uh, colleagues I have out in the audience, I'd ask you to ignore that table in specific for any cat calls that should originate from over there. Uh, but to call out just a few, my very close colleague, Brett Goldstein, sitting over there, uh, Jason DeHaan, Danielle Dumer, Francesca Rodriguez, Dan O'Neill of the Smart Chicago Collaborative. But I, as I think you'll see, as I go through some of this, uh, th thanks go largely to people who are not in this room, and that is Chica Chicago's tech community which is really very vibrant and playing a role um, in city government in a way that they haven't before. Um, my mom and dad are here, I don't know where they are, um, continuing their <laughs> decades long quest to figure out just what the heck I do for a living. Um, so good luck with that and of course my wife Robin who's um, sitting up here. So thanks again for having me. So I wanted to start with this. Um, this is a line from the transition report which comes very directly from the mayor. It's kind of a simple line. Um, but it, everything that we do in this position, Chief Technology Officer, and then my colleagues, Chief Data Officer, um, flows from this. And you, you may, if you know city government at all, you know that these are new roles. Um, they didn't exist under the former administration. They are in the mayor's office. So we have a kind of purview um, and an ability to look very holistically at policy level matters as they apply to technology um, that didn't necessarily exist before. So let's kind of break this apart. Um, set high standards. Well, what, what are standards? Standards are, are ways of measuring. So um, one of the things that we've had to figure out is how do you m quantify and measure what a government is doing? Um, open, how do we expose this then? If these are the vital signs of how s the city and how city government is doing, how do we get it out there? Uh, participatory. Now, I consider this the sort of fulcrum of, of, the, of our work in turning city government um, into a platform for interaction rather than a kind of vending machine where you put your money in and you get a service out or it doesn't give you anything, you kick it. Um, how do we make this participatory? And then lastly, the most important, how do we include everyone? Um, well, how do we do this? We do this with data. Um, let's see here. It's everywhere. It's in archives, government websites, being sensed from instrumentation in the environment, aerial imagery built from the ground up by citizens updating, tweeting, and texting. It's everywhere. And what does it allow us to do? Um, four things, and, and this really is the, the, the centerpiece of the work that we do. Transparency builds or rebuilds trust. Um, accountability builds a better workforce. So this is sort of internal performance management. Um, analysis, deep machine learning analysis allows us to build new processes and see connections between areas of the government and areas of the city that we hadn't looked at before. And the last one, which is, is really very new, open data as a driver of innovation, publishing what the city's doing as a kind of raw material for new businesses to be generated. So how are we doing this? Well, before you know, management and change comes measurement. And so before that comes exposure and publication. You have, to, you have to free the data, and uh, for internal and external scrutiny, this is data.cityofchicago.org. Um, there's a lot there, over 300 sets of data, over a million views. This is the, th these are the, this is the pulse of the city. Um, I'll show you some of the, the top sets here. Uh, always number one, for whatever reason, current employee salaries. Um, but there's more important, so that's not gonna tell you how well the city's working, uh, but some of these others will. Um, uh, Brett and, and, and Danielle update these, um, some, some of them nightly. This is where you go. This is the platform that things can be built on. Um, this here is a visualization, one of uh, dozens on the site. These are where all the bike racks, racks are in the city, for instance. Um, here's another example of transparency. You know, once upon a time, it actually snowed during the winter in, in Chicago. Um, and as we were getting ready this, this fall, uh, to equip Chicagoans with tools to take on, say, what we, what we went through last winter, 
We built something called ChicagoShovels.org, which is a great example of all the different transparency, accountability things coming together. This is, um, this is Plow Tracker. So for years, we've been actually uh, managing the, the plow fleet uh, out, of, out of streets and sanitation via GPS. So it seemed very much in line with the mayor's view of more information, not less, in making this live, putting this out there so people could see where the plows were um, in, in real time. I'll come back to Chicago Shovels because it's got a couple other really neat uh, examples. So how about accountability? How does that come in? Um, standards is about measurement, um, and part of reinventing government is um, to change the way business gets done based on hard data, right? So what you're looking at here, cityofchicago.org slash performance, is where we publish those, and those are done weekly. This is anything that touches a resident or a business, basically. So these are just some example categories. Um, the mayor talks a lot about time in line, reducing the friction, however it's manifested, whether you're in line or online or just headache of dealing with the government. Um, wait times on 311 calls, average time to get a traffic light fixed or to get your, your trash can replaced, these sorts of things. Um, here's an example, probably can't read it, but this is um, pothole repair. Uh, average days to pothole repair, it's, it's about four um, early on in October and diminishing as you go, this is um, one that's very near and dear to our hearts, which is um, days to issue a limited business license. So we've been collecting this for about 10 months now, and just in the last, say, two months, now we're activating this. Now we're saying, what do we do with this? And you may have heard about something called the Innovation Delivery Team, which is funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies. There's a couple of cities that are doing this. We're one of them. And one of the, so allowed us to, to hire new resource with special skills in, in this case, um, acting on that data that shows it's taking this long to get a small business license, it shouldn't. How do we now change the processes internally? So the part that we were a part of was actually establishing that baseline, and now you, you sort of real change um, is able to be sort of acted upon. Um, analysis, uh, analysis building new processes. Um, the mayor likes to say that, that he is all about data-driven decision-making, which, which I agree with. I've had some in the community point out that it really should be data-informed decision-making um, because there are lots of inputs to, to a decision. But basically what we're trying to do in City Hall is, you know, is to pair a real quantifiable um, decision point, perhaps with experience, with anecdote, with street sense, um, to, to inform the policy making in that office to the greatest degree. I'll give you an example of this. Um, this is the CTA Command Center, um, which not too many people get to see, but you can imagine what it looks like. They're looking at all the, the rail, they're looking at all the routes. It's, it's instructive for us in the city managing, sort of separately from CTA, in that it's a common map-based view of very different uh, data sources. Um, you know, and it allows everybody to have the same conversation about an incident that's happening at once. Um, the thing is, this doesn't exist actually for the city. Obviously, uh, the Office of Emergency Management does this, but we have so many vital signs of the city that could be brought together. All kinds of real-time data, historical data, um, scheduled interactions. We know where all these things are, but there's no holistic way of non-emergency operations management. Um, but the thing, and, and it, so what do all these things have in common? Um, they all have place, location, X, Y, lat, long. They have spatial relevance. And why that's important is that's the most sort of, um, the easiest way of, of seeing, you know, where a streets and sanitation crew is out and a CDOT crew is out and a CTA crew is out. And these, access to this kind of data visualized, sort of like this, is what keeps the same street from getting ripped up three times in the same month, right? This overlaying of all the city's spatial data. So this is kind of a, a work in progress. Um, and it gives us access to all kinds of things. There's the real-time operations. What's going on right now? How do we respond? This isn't emergency management. Obviously, we have that. We're, we're still doing that over in the Office of Emergency Management. But I like to think of managing a city day-to-day -day as managing the almost catastrophe every day, right? Not, not the actual emergency, but the, the little emergencies that are running a city. Um, they allow us deep historical analytics, right? So there are pieces of data in the world that are not spatial, economic, sociological. How do we tie those into to what we're seeing in, in what this map right here, by the way, is um, food deserts, as calculated by us in the city of Chicago. How do we you know, draw meaning out of that then maybe most exciting, certainly the most difficult, but it's predictive analytics. What factors give rise to outcomes um, that will allow us to intervene, to, to make an intervention and say, we've seen this pattern before, how can we or our partners or the private sector, whomever, make a difference to, to make that sort of un, uh, unwanted outcome not happen, foreclosure, blight, joblessness. 
that sort of thing. So uh, any nerds out in the office, uh, audience? Probably not. This, it, but if, if you are, the, these are the technologies that we're using. And it's kind of instructive, actually, because you probably haven't heard of many of these. Um, and that's because, you know, I come from IBM. I understand enterprise IT. Um, and obviously, there will always be systems inside the city that will require that. But there are also things that can be nimbler, that can be open source, that can be collaborative um, and cutting edge. And certain of what we're doing, specifically the, the sort of operations platform I just showed you uh, partakes of that. So the last one, um, open data building business. And, and this is sort of the platform as civic innovation. This is an image from a, a hackathon that Google sponsored uh, last year during Apps for Metro Chicago. This was a competition that we ran with the Metro Chicago Information Center um, to basically say to the community, you've got this data portal. You've got all these raw materials. Now, let's make it actionable and useful for people who aren't just you know statistics folks. So they did. Um, we got uh, about 80 apps. Um, I would argue that the, the most valuable deliverable from this app competition was the community itself. Um, we got some, uh, you know, bringing people together who were urbanists or who cared about certain issues, who also uh, could, could, you know, talk to someone who had the skills to build these applications. So let me show you some of these. Um, this is called Sweep Around Us. It's, it's maddeningly simple and maddening in the sense of why the heck didn't this exist before. But you put your address in. Um, the night before your area is to be street swept, it sends you a text message or um, an email saying, move your car, right? Makes sense. That data has always existed. But this is a good illustration of the fact that we can publish data and publish and get it out there and, and you receive kudos for it. It doesn't matter if it's not actionable through some sort of application. This is from a, a, just a developer in Chicago named Scott Robin. This is uh, this won the placemaking award that was uh, uh, sponsored by MPC. It's called Mi Parque. It's a, it's an app um, to create kind of a 24/7 town hall for the little village neighborhood um, around a community project, which is really their first really substantial uh, air set of green space. And it was built um, by a couple developers, who none of whom live in Little Village, uh, but were actually paired up with a community group there. Also a great model using city data. Um, in Spanish to give them the ability to vote, um, to, to uh, create polls, and basically just to give constant feedback as to what this green space can look like. The reason I love this, I think I speak for MPC too, is that there's nothing specific about this app that is Little Village or is green space. This could be reused dozens and dozens of times using different sets of city data to empower you know, hyper-local uh, concerns. Chicago lobbyists, this is an interesting site you could lose some time on. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, you, you could always have lost time on this because if you understood numbers, this is a front end to where the, the, the money is, where does it go, who's working for whom, um, kind of a social network for influence, if you want to call it that. Um, the interesting, so I'll come back to this actually. Um, Code for America, this has been in the news lately. So Code for America is Teach for America, but focused on cities and development of, of, of code. So programming, computer programming. We're one of um, a couple cities this year that, that got these fellows. So we have four fellows, very talented developers and designers, who are working with us uh, around 311. So 311, um, you guys probably know what that is. It's the interface in the city for service requests. It's a prime channel, not just for service requests, for any kind of request. You'd be amazed, well, maybe you wouldn't be amazed, how many people call 311 asking for help on the city's website. It's basically a way of uh, taking a pulse of, of the city. Uh, but it's, it's a very closed system. Uh, you may know there are no apps. There's no way to interact with, with 311 via Facebook or email or, or Twitter or anything like that. It's closed. It's a closed system. Well, they're changing that. These are the Code for Americas and the famous track jackets they wear. Um, but what this will enable us to do is treat 311 like we treat the CTA data. You've heard of train tracker. You've heard of bus tracker. These are not apps. These are feeds of where the buses and the trains are. And the CTA uh, is really leading the way here in showing us that, you know what, we're going to lead the app development to the market. And it's sort of an economic driver. We're going to lead the app development for Open311 to the people out there that want to create a, 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 you know, a phone to report a pothole or, or an app to, create a po to report a pothole, that sort of thing. We will be creating dashboards, though for aldermen to use, for the public to use, to see where, where the trends are in the city. So we're opening up 311 with Code for America. This is kind of interesting. This may be the first civic startup that I know of. So a startup 
that is focused on making the city better to come out of open data. These are the, the, this is the crew that built Chicago lobbyists that I sh showed you before. Now this is really key because you've probably heard of 1871. This is the, the sort of co-working accelerator incubator space, 50,000 square feet. It's, the, it's one corner of, of the Merchandise Mart, opens this spring. Very exciting for the digital sort of startup community here in Chicago. But I'm interested in what ideas come through there that actually have both civic value, so making it easier to get your pothole filled, but also have a business model behind them, right? We're starting to see this in different areas. And you've probably heard of social enterprise. Well, this is civic enterprise. And there's obviously a, a great overlap. But the Smart Chicago Collaborative, MacArthur Foundation, uh, myself, the city, we have a, a great interest in, in mentoring and figuring out if this is a viable uh, market segment. So, a um, couple stats. An another hat that I wear, in addition to sort of internal technology, is being a convener, really an impatient convener, to use the words of Anish Chopra, of our technology community here. So digital, uh, uh, biotech, clean tech, advanced manufacturing, and there's just a lot to be proud of here. We have over 50 publicly traded high tech companies, 199 companies on last year's Inc. Uh, 5,000 fastest growing companies, nearly 270,000 employees in the infotech sector. I think that's actually a little higher now. 300 corporate R&D facilities, three federally funded research centers, 16 metro area universities. Um, and all of that fuels the thing that gets the most press, which rightly so, is our startup culture. Um, it's one of the hottest stories in the country. And if you don't, you know, if you don't move in these circles or pay real close attention to this, here's a data point. Um, Illinois is now second only to California in VC investment in internet businesses. Um, we've had 23 billion in startup exits over the last five years. Venture capital from things like LightBank, Apex, Sandbox, Hyde Park Angels, uh, and New World Ventures. So, you know, what's really, you know, you ask yourself, okay, I think it's a foregone conclusion that we are shortly going to be on the same footing as competitor areas of the, of the, um, of the country. So what I ask myself is when we get there, what's going to differentiate us? What about Chicago makes us different? And I think one little piece of that is that the sort of growing pool of serial entrepreneurs, as they call themselves here, that serve as mentors right back into the startup landscape. That's a huge part of the accelerators we have here. In fact, probably in terms of sheer number of hours spent, it's established businesses, in some cases big industry, serving as mentors locally right back into it. And I like to think that that's, that's something unique to us. One thing I wanted to mention that, that we're starting up um, in city government is, is a partner forum that will convene a few times a year, actually. So this is open to technologists, big and small, CIOs of big companies, but also startups, and then the, the whole landscape of, of kind of technology partners, just to keep that conversation going with the city of Chicago. You know, we've got a lot going on. You might argue we, there are more going on than there ever has been, which makes being grounded with the community here uh, even more important. So stay tuned for, for announcements. Uh, along this line. So I like to say the city's a platform, and there's a couple of different ways to read that. Um, my friend Andrew Roche calls the merger of social media and e-government, um, we government, um, which is a little clumsy, but actually kind of fits in this case. There's a lot of social media going on in the city of Chicago. These are all the, these are, these are all the ways of interacting um, with the city. And I will just say, I will not name, but there are other large cities in the United States that maintain a social media presence that's totally one way. They do not respond. And you know, to me, that's no, no different than a press release or an email blast that comes from a machine. Um, all of these accounts have human beings, in some cases, commissioners uh, behind them. Um, we had the first uh, town hall. Uh, we've had a couple of these now. But this is the first live stream of a mayor um, in a question and answer period. And I, I will say that you know, seeing him on, on the computer screen, great. Um, seeing the conversation that was going down the right-hand side, I can think of, uh, on one hand, the number of conversations of peop with people from all parts of the city in one forum having a fairly level-headed conversation. I mean, it happens in public transit sometimes, and only when something happens to sort of bond everybody together. Somebody's being you know, um, out of line or something like this. I want to figure out how we can continue these conversations without having to have a live stream of the mayor. It was really very fascinating. I encourage you to, to tune in to the next one. Um, during the budget season last year, um, this, is, this was chicagobudget.org, um, thousands of questions came in and, and suggestions, you know, spend money this way, don't spend it this way. Every single one of those questions was responded to, and in fact, what you're seeing is a view from the data portal. The question itself or the suggestion itself plus the response 
from the subject matter expert, whomever that was in the government, is there you know, as a piece of data. That is as uh, useful as a sort of record of where we've come as you know, how many potholes are getting filled. Um, and also a good example of the, of the back and forth. Now, this is also part of Chicago shovels. Um, I will say it's very underutilized. There hasn't been a lot of shoveling of sidewalks. But this is called Adopt a Sidewalk, and it, it shows a couple things. I said the city is a platform. Well, this very literally is the, the public way. Um, a couple reasons for doing this. Uh, Code for America last year in Boston developed something called Adopt a Hydrant, where someone could just claim a point and then just shovel the hydrant out. Um, and you know they had as much snow as we did last year. All that code's open source. And the thing about sort of municipal sharing of code and of talent, which I really think is one of the next waves here, is that we all, or many, many cities share the same problems. And so something like this, we just took that code and said, let's do one better. Let's do the public way, let's do, or the sidewalks, I should say. Bit of a trickier problem. One, we didn't have a map of sidewalks. And two, it's not a point. It's a shape, right? So, you know, figured out how to, how to get that. Um, you can claim your, your, your sidewalk. You can abandon it which you shouldn't because you're required to shovel it by the city of Chicago, thank you very much. Um, uh, but, but the real point here, and I guess we'll wait till next winter to see if this pans out, um, is to claim it as complete. Right, so over time, you can claim your neighbors, you can claim your parents, um, and it, there's, a, there's an element of gameplay in this, um, an element of sort of coming together, um, of, of doing something you know, for, for your neighbor. The sidewalk was sort of the original uh, social network. Um, so this is, this is out there at uh, chicagoshovels.org. So what are people doing on the sidewalk? Well, they're probably looking at their cell phone and they've just bumped into you or are about to trip over the curb. Um, one of the things that we realize here is that um, in not so many years, it will probably seem quaint that e-government or interacting with a government via computer was actually done sitting at a computer. Um, you know, smartphone usage, tablet usage um, is off the charts. And so there really isn't a mobile experience for the city of Chicago right now. And we are in the process of a study, actually, that's going to help us um, to, to attend to that. You know, most government services can be procured online, um, sort of on site, via a remote uh, uh, or a mobile device. And so this is a real focus of ours. Um, Network public objects, next time you walk, or when you leave here, um, think about how many IP addresses, those are internet addresses, how many internet connection points you pass as you're walking down the, the sidewalk. It's actually astonishing. Um, the CTA has rolled out these, these, these very cool information panels, some of which are interactive. Um, you've got public bike share coming from, from CDOT later this year. All of those stations have to be on the internet. You've got 4,500 parking meters. Those are standalone, solar-powered, networked computers. Um, even some of those trash cans that you see on the sidewalk are network-capable, the, the big belly solar compactors. And then the, the, the sort of biggest distributed network public object is you know, the cell phones and the, and the pocket computers. Um, and yet, none of them talk to each other. It's like that photo from the 19th century. Um, it, the digital public way, such as one exists, is inefficient. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is, is stitching those together, both from a network standpoint, but also from a platform standpoint, right? Let me give you an example. You may not know this, not many do, but there is a little SMS short code on every bus stop sign. If you don't have a smartphone, you can actually get the upcoming buses by just texting that number, which is unique to each sign, and then you get a little text back saying what's coming. What I like about this, even though it's super low tech, is, is conceptually, you're, you're, you're interrogating a, a public object. You're interacting sort of one-on-one. -on -one. Now, of course, technically you're not. You're going over a cell network and it's returning information. But that idea of being able to interact with the built environment, the built platform in the public way, just like we do with the data portal, to build an app on top of the, bike, the, the public bike share, or to, to, to interlock the bus shelter with the public bike share two miles away so that when you're doing wayfinding and journey planning, it tells you, you know, you might want to stop one stop later because there's no bikes at that public bike share. It knows. Um, this, is, this is as much a focus of ours as building out the data platform. It's the platform that is the city itself. This gave me a chuckle. This is an actual ad in a bus shelter from DePaul University. But bus shelters are really kind of, I, I never, you know, what, what am I, what, where, where am I now? You know, saying that this bus shelter is cool, but like it's a moment of rare urban pause in the urban flow. It's a sort of a captured audience um, and it's, it's, it's protected. So 
keep your eyes out for the bus shelters. I think we've got good things in store. Here's just kind of a mock-up from some of our friends at, at Urban Scale about the, the kind of services that might be offered there. Wayfinding and journey planning, service discovery, ambient data around. Uh, Karen Weiger, the Chief Sustainability Officer, someone I work with very um, often, is very interested in, if this is a network, it can be sensing things like CO2 and ambient uh, air quality and things like that, um, and then hyper-local stuff. But one thing I like to keep in mind, uh, the science fiction author William Gibson said, right when the first iPad comes out and the third one comes out tomorrow, is that uh, we won't know what the iPad's really about until we see what the street decides to do with it. And that's really true, and we try, I try to keep that in mind as, as someone who's helping to design you know, technologies that many of you know, you, you write out the specs, you design to the spec, you test it, if it fails, you remake it, You're, you know, it's very tightly controlled. But that's actually not the, that's not how the city works. You know, you design something as an architect or an urban planner, it gets reworked by the public. Some of the most interesting things that are done in the public space in communities came from the ground up using the bits and pieces that were designed by the city or by a developer. We need to think about how we open up technology to solve a problem, but to leave it so that it's, it's like the data portal, right? I wouldn't have thought to create ChicagoRatWatch.com, but somebody did, you know what I mean? B because the data was out there. You leave it open enough so that there's, there's creativity that can be done. So let's talk about the last part of this. Um, set high standards for open participatory government to involve all Chicagoans. This is, this is what we're up against. Um, now these are a couple years old and we'll have new data very shortly. 61% um, um, uh, with no internet, 31% um, with dial-up only, and 8% with broadband. Our focus here, and we have many partners in this endeavor, many of whom are in the room, is, is three-pronged. So access, so that's the physical connection, globally competitive broadband. Um, adoption, so that's, that's skills, that's digital literacy, easily as important um, as, as the former. And then applications. So when you bring these two together, what does it actually mean? What can you do with it? Excuse me. Um, we have many programs in this, this area. I won't go into all of this. I'm, I'm happy I could give a, a talk just on this. Um, this has been going on for a couple of years. Um, we were the, the recipients of two R grants, Sustainable Broadband Adoption and Public Computer Centers. Now, neither of these were the actual infrastructure pieces. Sustainable Broadband Adoption is more the literacy piece. What can be done with these skills, these internet skills. And the public computing centers, that is infrastructural, but not network. That's um, spaces out in the community where we can make sure that folks have access to the internet and to computers. Um, what we're lucky to have, also kind of a outgrowth in some ways uh, of the stimulus funds, is the Smart Chicago Collaborative. Um, Dan O'Neill's here today, he heads that up. Um, it is a joint project between the Chicago Community Trust, Terry Mazzani, MacArthur Foundation, Julia Stash, and um, the city, and I represent that. It's, it's, you know, they have both the programmatic depth, being with CCT and MacArthur, and the geographic breadth, being paired with the city, to push this forward. We, you know, we ask ourselves, quite a lot. What is the post ARA? What does the post stimulus landscape look like? And with the Smart Chicago Collaborative, we're, we're really empowered to do things out in our community um, as we're coming to the end of, of some of the stimulus funding. So this is an example of um, some of our after school programming, um, digital youth after school programming, a uh, project called Everyday Digital, um, which is like skills. You, you may know that many large employers have switched uh, to online only applications. Um, we teach those skills here, basic computer literacy, basic internet literacy. Um, digital youth summer jobs, which is a, a very big deal to Mayor Emanuel, part of our larger sort of um, summer focus. You might have remember one summer Chicago last year. Um, far and away, our most uh, requested class sort of lines out the door. Um, the demand for, you know, e-government, this is Civics 2.0. I don't know if that's a comment on how hard it is to work with government employees face to face, but they love doing it online. Um, and, and, and this actually shows, this is the validation really for everything I showed you before. The demand is there. Um, we see it in these classes for interacting online with government. Um, FamilyNet, yeah, I think the FamilyNet computing centers, these are like community hubs uh, for resident training and community internet access. So a lot of this is, um, well actually the previous screen is train the trainers, really getting them um, to be able to spread knowledge at places like this. So public computing centers, um, the newest opens tomorrow at Dearborn Homes, which is really very exciting. Uh, some of the residents of Dearborn, Dearborn Homes um, are running the, the public computing center there. Um, you might have heard the smart communities uh, 
program, which is a partnership with LISC. These are five areas in the city, Auburn, Gresham, Chicago Lawn, Humboldt Park, Pilsen, and Englewood, that have a very special focus um, with this literacy training. Um, they, uh, Auburn, they have portals um, that are kind of centerpieces to come for digital skills in that, um, in that neighborhood. Um, you may have seen these, I don't think these are running anymore, but these were bus ads uh, for smart communities in Chicago. Really trying to get the word out that you can do all kinds of things. Find ancestors, check your grades, so there were CPS specific uh, modules in this. Um, and then possibly the, the most important one uh, is called Tech Locator. So this attempts to isolate all the city uh, run public computing centers, anything out in the community, um, and then our partners, where they run it too, um, find, find that near you. Where are the touch points? Um, and if you think about my vision that I was describing of the digital public way, all those underutilized network connections out on the sidewalk, each one of which could be a route into government or a, a road onto the internet, this map could get a lot, lot fuller. So I will close there with a reminder of how far we've come. This was um, government information not that long ago. Um, we have a long way to go, uh, but we have the skills, uh, we have the talent, we have the community certainly, and, and even volunteers uh, to do this. Uh, I love being a Chicagoan. I'm very proud to be helping make the city a better place to live and work, and I thank you for your time today. If you have a question, uh, uh, Ms. Brenda, raise your hand. I think you, you might have snowed him. Uh, while she's going there, uh, adopt a sidewalk. This could lead to sidewalk imperialism, just so you know. I could, I could see that happening. Uh, we've had urban imperialism in the 19th century. And could you explain what thread, threadless nude no more is? What what? You had a app up there, Threadless Nude No More. Oh. This, this is very serious yeah. stuff. So you've heard of Threadless, right? They're, they're a huge success story here. I think that's their tagline. Threadless makes clothing, which makes you nude no more. Um, yeah, Threadless, it's a, it's a community, uh, people submit their own designs to Threadless. Uh, those are voted on. The ones that get enough votes get, get made. Very successful company here. I knew that. That's I just, a great first question. Somebody probably didn't know that. I just wanted to... Uh, 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 no, City Club B, no questions, eh? This is the first time, John, you should be proud, the first time in history of this club, no one has asked a question. I've, I've confused everyone. No, 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 no. I think it's more Shakespearean than that. Cowards die many times before their deaths. The valiant taste death but one. Oh, here's a question. Sing it out loud. We don't have no time to write them out. Go ahead. John, great presentation. Thanks, Terry. Thank you for sharing the vision. Uh, what are the ideas for how to secure broadband access throughout Chicago? Mm -hmm. Sure. The question was, what are the ideas f for securing broadband access throughout Chicago? Um, it's, it's a multi-pronged approach, actually. One is to work with many of the partners who are actually here in, in the room, AT&T and others. Um, there is a program here called Internet Essentials, specifically with Comcast, for instance, um, to bring um, to bring low-cost broadband to neighborhoods. I think um, we, we continue we continue fighting that fight. We also start looking at leveraging the city's own networks. Okay, um, we are in every neighborhood via our libraries, our public schools. Where you know we have a great deal of underutilized fiber in, in other areas. How do we use that to to to, to open it up? One of, the, one of the, the things I think about a lot is um, Wells Park, where I, my wife and I spend most of our summers uh, with our, our, our boys playing, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, all right, Park District, woo, um, is um, right next to a regional library, Seltzer, that has a pretty powerful Wi-Fi cloud coming out of it. And two of the four diamonds um, get Wi-Fi, and the other two don't. And since we spend so much time there, sometimes three games in a day, you actually see that that, that, that park is used differently, where the bleed over from the library is. Because, you know, you got parents who are bored between innings and um, things like that. Um, it, it was instructive in a way of how do, we, how do we capitalize on the infrastructure that's already there? Obviously, we need the private sector to come in and do some of the heavy lift in areas where there just is, is nothing. Um, but remember the digital public way. Every one of those networked things, which out in the public way, like the, the, the parking machines and like, 
you know, could be stitched together. There's already a lot of network. Now, you know, I wouldn't call it broadband, um, but could be stitched together in certain places um, to, to lift the network up. So we've got a, a number of different approaches. Obviously, um, none of what I was talking about can really come to pass without ubiquitous access, which I, I'm coming to see more and more as a, as a right. Thanks, Michael. Well, uh, so, uh, sorry, what excites me about um, uh, the plan, economic development plan that was done through the WBC? Um, two parts of that. The first, I think the first point is advanced manufacturing. Um, we need to make that sexy again. Uh, advanced manufacturing to me is not shipping girders around. It's about, it is absolutely high tech. And I go back to what I was saying about, I just take it as a foregone conclusion that we are going to be on uh, equal footing with Cambridge and, and Silicon Valley. What makes us different? I think the legacy that we have of making actual things and making new processes for making actual things differentiates us. Does that involve computers and high tech? Absolutely it does. Is it a website? No. We need a, a, that, so that first bullet point, I see things like 1871 and Accelerate Labs and Sandbox, great accelerators of digital companies. Why don't we have that for makers, right? For fabricators, for people you know, developing new skills and making stuff. So that kind of caught my eye. Um, and then the, the, I think like the se sixth or seventh point is just about fostering the new innovation economies. And that to me speaks to digital, it speaks to clean tech which I, I, I love because it, that also capitalizes on making things, uh, something that we're very good at. And then, you know, we've got a pretty strong biotech and life sciences here. So, yeah, that was very positive. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right, sorry. Um, he said, great job, thanks very much. Let's all go home. Um, no. He said, um, with open source as, as one of the things in your toolkit, how are you dealing with security? Well, the, the, the short answer is, um, you know, the open source work that we're doing um, is, is not our mission critical systems, right? Has nothing to do with cybersecurity, has nothing to do with ERP. Um, but, you know, in, in certain cases, these are open source platforms that have become hardened uh, over time. And, you know, you, we don't have to pay millions of dollars to a, a consultancy or a vendor to come in and tell us that it's secure. We've got, you know, our own talent. We've got years and years of, of, of talent. Um, in the community having, having done that. It's much easier to patch something, for instance, when you can do that. Um, but some of these systems are internal, you know, and they're behind things that have been hardened over time. Um, where it makes sense to share the code, um, we do that. And so, um, you know, that's basically it. Thanks. John, thanks for the presentation. As a thought leader, technology, cloud. We hear it every day. Just, I just heard a report driving in 13 million people are going to be employed in the cloud in the next three years. What's your thought? 13, uh, the question was what I think about cloud. 13 million people are going to be empl uh, employed in the cloud, presumably pilots or angels. Um, no, cloud, you know, sort of virtualized platforms. Uh, so data.city of Chicago is in the cloud. That is through a vendor called Socrata. Um, I think I speak for all my colleagues here that we see a lot of areas that city really shouldn't be in, in technology anymore, could easily move to the cloud. Um, there are a couple things in the, pro in the public sector that make that a little trickier, not at all impossible. Um, you know, records retention laws, for instance, um, make us, uh, we're having to figure out what that actually means in the cloud. But absolutely, we're looking at, at it um, for all kinds of reasons, not the least of which is that, you know, probably don't need to be managing um, a lot of the systems that we are locally. So, I will be there. Thank you. Oh, yeah. uh, before I give John his well-deserved gift, you know, I now realize why there were no questions. You're all so high-tech, none of you can write. <laughs>